it's only a matter of time. And uh, my father kept reassuring my mother and me, there's nothing to worry about. We're in a neutral country. If war comes, we're safe. Um, now, mind you, of course, we left all of our belongings in Vienna, silverware, uh, uh, china, furniture, everything was left there. So we had to move into a small furnished apartment, uh, a considerable change in our lifestyle. But we were alive and things were, went very well. September 1, 1939, Hitler invades uh, Poland. Nothing to worry about. We're in a safe country. We're neutral. Uh, this illusion goes until the 10th of May 1940, uh, when the Nazis invaded Belgium, Holland, Luxembourg, and began their thrust against France. At this stage of the game, <clears throat> my father felt an obligation towards his employees. He decides to go uh, to his office that morning. On the way to the office, there's an identity check. He pulls out his passport, German passport. The police thought, ah, we got ourselves a German paratrooper, fifth columnist. They promptly arrest him. It took my mother three days to locate him. Uh, we were allowed to visit him, bring him a suitcase and a blanket. And at that point, my father said to my mother, take the kid and your mother, my grandmother, who also lived in Brussels at the time, and get the hell out of here fast as you can. You don't want to get caught between two armies. You've got the Germans moving in from the Northeast, and you have the French and the Brits trying to support the Belgians moving in from the Southwest. You don't want to get caught between the two. My mother uh, takes this to heart. She decides that we're getting out of here. Uh, together with hundreds of thousands of refugees, we headed for the coast um, to Ostend, and somehow we were going to make our way to Paris, where my mother's uh, sister lived. And besides, uh, France had the Maginot Line, and France couldn't possibly lose the war. This was impossible, so we would be safe in France. I might add here that shortly before the 10th of May, my mother had taken me to a movie, and we saw an American film uh, called Test Pilot. Most of you young people probably never heard of the famous actor who was in it, someone named Clark Gable. Uh, when I came out of the movie, I said to my mother, when I grow up, I want to be a test pilot. That's cool, a silk scarf, goggles, a leather helmet, a leather jacket. I want to be a test pilot. So while we were fleeing uh, on the roads, we were constantly, every 20 minutes or so, there would be Stuka dive bombers that would attack the roads, machine gunning them. We all jumped into the ditches along the road. Uh, people never got up. Cows fell next to me. And I, this is 1940, I'm 11 years old. The only thing I can think of is, when I grow up, I want to be a pilot and sit in the cockpit. Da, 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 da. I'm actually a lot of fun. Well, what do you expect from an 11-year-old? Don't know any better. So we managed to get to Paris after about nine days. Uh, we arrive at my aunt's apartment. We are no sooner in there. There's an air raid alert. My mother said, I didn't come to Paris to get bombed. Let's get out of here. We're heading south. We're going to Bordeaux on the Atlantic coast in the south of France. We managed to get on a train this time, I arrive in Bordeaux. And at this point, my mother's German upbringing clicks into place. We must go to the police and register. Well, in those days, if you came into a new town, the first thing you had to do is go to the police, register in order to get a residence permit. And with the residence permit, you would then be able to either rent a hotel room or a furnished room or whatever. You could try to look for uh, employment. But without that, you didn't belong there. So mother goes to the French police, explains her situation. The French policeman scratches his head and says, Voyons, madame, you're born in Germany. But you married an Austrian, so that makes you an Austrian. But there's no more Austria. And you're here with your son and with your mother. And you don't have a visa. You shouldn't be in France. And you come from Belgium. We never had a case like that before. Why don't you go to the gendarmerie? Dutifully, my mother goes to the gendarmerie, which is sort of a national police in France. Uh, same thing. Don't know what to do with you, madame. Why don't you go to the prefecture? which is sort of a county or state administrative uh, office. Mother goes there, explains her situation, and the man says, ah, madame, we know exactly what to do, people such as you. You take a train, you go to a place called Oloron-Sainte-Marie, 
which is in the Pyrenees Mountains near the Spanish border, and we have experts. They know exactly how to deal with you. With the little money that my mother has, we get on a train with her mother. We arrive in Oloron Saint Marie. The railway station is swarming with French gendarmes with submachine guns. They get us off the train, load us onto trucks, and 20 minutes later, we are dumped into a French concentration camp. Now, mind you, this is not a death camp. The French had created a number of concentration camps in the late 1930s in order to accommodate and hold or pen in refugees from the Spanish Civil War. So we are now in this concentration camp. Uh, they certainly weren't prepared for such an influx of refugees. Uh, I was, this is 1940, I'm still 11 years old. I'm in the same barrack with my mother and my grandmother. We slept on the floor once a week. They came and swept, off, uh, swept up the old straw and threw some fresh straw on the floor. Uh, there were no washing facilities within the barrack, 60 people to a barrack. Uh, approximately 50, 55 barracks within the camp, double row of barbed wire around it. Uh, the only washing facilities were outside a cold water spigot. Um, toilet facilities were located about 200, 240 feet, uh, yards away from the barracks. Uh, this is uh, June. It is the south of France. It is hot. Uh, France is very popular. That's where they make a lot of perfume. This ain't the place where they made it. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, the toilet facilities were open pits uh, and uh, with a wooden bar across them and you just balanced yourself there. And in order to get there, you usually had to walk through a muddy path with mud up to your ankles. Uh, mother had been a phys ed teacher. She was physically strong. Uh, she was tall. She spoke French fluently. Uh, because of that, she was made barracks chief as barracks chief, she uh, was called into the uh, camp commander's office uh, to every two or three days. And this was the only opportunity that we had to find out just what's going on in the outside world. Uh, mind you, there's no radio, there's no television, there are no newspapers, we're totally cut off. And the only news that we were getting were from new prisoners brought into the camp, and those were usually rumors, and you know what rumors are. So, we really didn't know what was going on. 22 of June, uh, 1940, France collapses, surrenders, signs an armistice with Germany. Uh, mother learns about this. About four or five days later, a German Wehrmacht, that's the German Army Commission, is to come and inspect the camp. Because uh, in that camp, there were also a lot of non-Jewish uh, Germans who were enemy aliens as we were considered, and the French had locked us up. I mean, as an 11-year-old, I represented an immediate threat to French national security. So, uh, I'm there, and uh, mother says, we are not going to croak in this place. She positions herself at the entrance of the camp. When the Wehrmacht inspection team arrives, mother takes her passport in hand, a German passport, rushes forward to the commanding officer there, yells as loud as she can, Heil Hitler, I am a citizen of the Third Reich. I have been held by these lousy, stinking, no good Frenchmen for the past six weeks. I demand to be released immediately. The German officer turns to the French camp commander, you call taxi for madame. You pay taxi. Taxi takes madame wherever she wants to go. 20 minutes later, we were out of there. <clears throat> now the question was, where to? Mother says to the cab driver, take us to Spain. Impossible, madame. The Spaniards won't let anybody in, and the French and the Germans won't let anybody out. But where can you take us? Well, I can take you uh, north. Take us north, please. We drive north. We come through a town called Toulouse. My grandmother by that time had found out that her other daughter, the aunt who was in Paris, had made it to Toulouse. My grandmother says to my mother, look, you've got enough with the kid on your hands. Uh, I'm going to bail out and stay with, with my other daughter, with your sister. And that's the last we heard of her. And uh, we continue driving north until we come to a town called Osh. And uh, on the outskirts, there are people coming out of the town. They tell us, don't go any further. 
there are Germans on the other side. We get out of the cab, and this is where my story becomes the story of the rescuers. And I'll be talking to you primarily not about the atrocities, but I'm going to be talking to you about the rescuers and how important they are certainly in my life and in the life of anyone else that they have saved. My mother sees a great big red brick building. She rings the bell. It turns out that it's a convent. The nun that opens the door asks my mother to come in. She explains her situation. The nun says, fear not, madam. We will take care of you and your child. You are welcome here. Uh, the nuns get in touch with a uh, small food distribution center, uh, which had been set up uh, in the late 1930s in order to accommodate Spanish refugees again. And uh, this uh, food distribution center was uh, operated jointly by the Swiss Red Cross and uh, American Quakers. It has nothing to do with Quaker Oats. Uh, for those of you who don't know who the Quakers are, uh, it is a religious group. Uh, there are only about 300,000 worldwide. Uh, all I can say is they do uh, a totally dis so much good that is totally disproportional to their numbers. Anyhow, it is my good fortune that the Quakers decided to give my mother a part-time job. With a part-time job, she is able to go to the local police station, get permission to stay in town, register. With that, we're able to rent a very small one-room apartment, and I mean one room. Um, and uh, mother is happy. She's able to bring, uh, bring home some food every night. Uh, she has a small uh, income. Uh, she's looking for my father. We ultimately locate him in one of the French concentration camps. It turns out to be the same camp, Gurs, where my mother and I and my grandmother had been uh, locked up before. Uh, father was 16 years older than my mother. Uh, it was customary back in those days that the young man wouldn't consider getting married until he was financially established uh, in order to ma marry a young girl and take care of her properly. So he was 54, uh, 52 at that time. Uh, he, uh, the camp had all kinds of diseases, um, the uh, typhus, typhoid, uh, a lot of people died in the camp from the disease, from hunger. and. Um, uh, ultimately, mother succeeds in giving, getting him a uh, convalescence leave, valid for 30 days. Uh, I think the camp commander figured this old guy is going to croak anyhow. Why have him die in the camp and have to bury him? Let his wife take care of it. Anyhow, he's able to join us in Osh, uh, in our one-room apartment. A, um, of course, under the Vichy laws defining who is a Jew, Vichy laws were even more stringent, more restrictive than the Nazis' own Nuremberg laws were. So my father was not allowed to work, uh, and uh, we, were, we had to register as Jews at the time, and, uh, but at least mother, father, and I, we were together. Uh, move the clock a little bit forward. I'm going to French schools. Uh, 1940. Uh, two comes uh, in the summer. The summer school uh, is uh, finishes in France uh, in July. Uh, the uh, Quakers are operating a uh, summer camp, approximately 35 miles away from Osh, in a in a town called Condon. Uh, that's the way the French pronounce it. If I wrote it down and you read it, you would say condom. Uh, the uh, town is very proud today. They have a condom museum, too. Uh, anyhow, at that time, I had no idea what this was. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, mother succeeds in getting me a spot in this uh, summer camp. Uh, I heard whispering before I was shipped to the camp uh, about roundups in Paris, roundups of Jews. They were being shipped to, uh, quote, resettlement in the East. Uh, we didn't quite know what this was. Anyhow, 42, I'm 13, 13 and a half. Hey, happy-go-lucky, I'm going to the summer camp. The food is good. I'm with, with other kids. Great. The lady in charge of that camp is a very devout Catholic lady, Madame Cavaillon. And uh, she takes me to 7 o'clock mass just about every morning. Uh, I uh, serve as altar boy on occasion. Everything is going fine. 
until the middle of June when all of a sudden my father appears unannounced. Uh, I'm greatly surprised. He has ridden a bicycle. I mentioned to you that he was sick. He had developed heart trouble in the concentration camp. Uh, I was a little bit nonplussed. What is he doing? Bicycling 35 miles in the warm summer weather of France, southern France. And my father said, look, I don't have much time. Uh, I have a pouch for you that I would like to give you. Uh, and uh, of course, I tried to open it. He said, no, no, don't open it. Put it in your pocket. Uh, it's for you. And he said, unfortunately, I must turn around and go back to Austria at this point, because under the laws, Vichy laws, Jews are not allowed to be on the street after dark. So I have to return to Austria before the evening. And uh, he climbs on his bicycle. And we were standing on the crest of a hill. And as the bicycle disappeared from my view, I, I was suddenly overcome with a horrible feeling that uh, this is the last time that I'll ever see him. So uh, I wasn't too wrong. As soon as he was gone, I had to look inside the bag. What do I find in there? I find my mother's bracelet. I find a couple of rings that belonged to her. I find my father's a gold pocket watch. Uh, he had some uh, luck, good luck charms that were there. And there was a small amount of money. So I uh, realized immediately that they must be apprehensive that something terrible is about to happen to them. Uh, on August the 27th, Mrs. Cavaillon calls me uh, into her office and says to me, I'm terribly sorry, Pierre. I, and that, at that time was Pierre Fido. Uh, she says, I have some bad news. I've just learned that your parents were arrested yesterday on the 26th of August in, in Osh. Uh, I don't know where they are, but fear nothing. I'm going to organize a novena. And for those of you who are not Catholics here, novena is nine days of rosary prayers. At the end of the novena, your parents will be restored to you. And uh, I believe this fervently. We prayed. And um, about four days later, Mrs. Cavaillon uh, comes into the breakfast room and says, you look very sick. You must go to bed right away. There's something wrong with you. I said, I feel fine. Shut up. Go to bed. You're sick. Uh, I obey. I go to bed. And, about, and she gives me some miserable potion that I'm supposed to take. And about 20 minutes later, two friends, gendarmes, arrive. They examine me, take my temperature. Yes, madam, she, he, the poor kid is much too sick. We can't take him now. Uh, but we will be back to take him in a, a, another day or so. Now, as I learned years later, Mrs. Cavaillon was warned ahead of time, which means that somebody in this gendarmerie had a problem with going to arrest a 13-year-old or a 13 and a half year old And for him to call and warn her was not just a question of putting his job in jeopardy, but he was putting his life in jeopardy. This was strictly illegal under the laws. You are not allowed to help Jews, to hide Jews, or assist them in trying to escape the law. So this man put his own life on the, on the line. He put the life of his family in jeopardy. His kids could have been taken away from him for purposes of re-education. His property could have been confiscated. So thank you, whoever that man was. But here is somebody who did the right thing. Um, a day or two later, my, Mrs. Cavillon receives a postcard from my parents. Uh, they report that they are in a, a transit camp in a place called Drancy. It's a suburb of Paris. Uh, still don't know what's going to happen to them. As I discovered also only about 10 years ago, uh, there was a side letter that was written to Madame Cavaillon in which my mother begged her to please take care of my son, Pierre. I put him in your hands. I trust you. I hope that you will be able uh, to save him. So again, my mother and my father must have had a pretty uh, bad idea as to what was going to happen. Um, the police comes on two more occasions to arrest me. Mrs. Cavaillon, in the meantime, contacts the Quakers and tells them, I've got a Jewish boy on my hands. The police have already been here once. They said they're coming back. You've got to take this kid off my hands. The Quakers write to her and tell her, you're in luck. We've just received permission from the Vichy government 
to send 500 orphans uh, to the United States. Uh, we will include Pieper, uh, Pierre in this list of uh, children. Uh, he is going to have to fill out this form. Uh, by the way, I have copies of the form. I have copies of the ex letter, ex letters that were exchanged. This was all found about eight, 10 years ago in French archives. Um, I got a form to fill out. I fill it out, name, date of birth, so forth. Religion, Catholic. Two days later, Mrs. Cavallon gets a letter from the Quakers, but Madame Cavallon, you don't understand. We're trying to save some Jewish children. <laughs> We're not trying to save Catholics. Mrs. Cavallon writes back four page letter, how ironic. You will not take the kid because he says that he's Catholic, and when I show his baptismal certificates to the French gendarmes, they tell me it's a piece of crap, it's worthless, the kid is a Jew as defined by the Vichy laws. Uh, on the 6th of November, Mrs. Cavallon takes me to Marseille, which is the home uh, where, where the Quakers have an office, and this is where they are assembling the 500 children that are supposed to go to the United States. The ship was scheduled to, to, live, uh, to leave uh, from Marseille around the 26th or the 27th of November. Uh, I say goodbye to Mrs. Cavallon. Uh, I'm temporarily put into a, an orphanage. And uh, on the 10th of November, uh, the Western Allies, namely the United States and Britain at that point, decided, without consulting me, to uh, land in North Africa. And uh, when they debark in North Africa, the first thing that the Germans do, we now have a good pretext for protecting the south of France, the Vichy government, they occupied the rest, the so-called free zone of France, the Vichy part of France, and uh, uh, Marseille is swarming with German soldiers. In my diary, I write, goodbye America. I realized that this was curtain for me at that point. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, now, uh, I forgot one thing. I began my first diary on the very day when I learned that my parents had been arrested on the 27th of August. I, all of this is documented in my diaries. And uh, so now I'm being bounced from one orphanage to another. Uh, there isn't enough food. I'm hungry. Uh, this is 1942, 13, 13 and a half. Uh, not too smart, but uh, hungry. And in one of the homes where I am, across the street, there's a farm which is occupied by a Waffen SS detachment of, with armored personnel carriers and uh, uh, weapons carriers, and they move in there. And I see they're having a grand time, they're eating well, and I go across the street and talk, talk them up in German. Ach, wunderbar, we have a young boy here, a nice German boy, was machst du denn hier? What are you doing here? And, Shh, don't tell anybody, but my father is in the Gestapo. I don't know how I came up with that. Maybe I was trying to imitate my mother when she bluffed her way out of the concentration camp. So I told them that my father and my mother and I, we came to France before the war because we all speak French fluently. I listened to everything that my school classmates are telling me about their parents, what they think, what they say. I report this to my father and it helps him enormously in his business. So. I'm invited to have spaghetti and meatballs. They were delicious. Uh, they break out nice, good milk chocolate. I'm eating. I'm on top of the world when the director of that orphanage sees me over there, and he can't wait to get a hold of me, grab me by the scruff of the neck, and immediately ship me out of there. He said, are you out of your mind talking to these Nazis? Don't you know what you're doing? Hey, I ate well. <laughs> so I'm shipped off. Uh, in the diaries, I mentioned how I begged him not to ship me there. Once he had shipped me to the other orphanage, when he came to visit several days later, I begged him to please take me back, which he ultimately did. Move the clock forward. We're now coming into January of 1943. Um, the uh, rumor spread in Marseille that the Nazis are about to round up all of the Jews in the south of France, in the Marseille area. I'm told to get ready to pack my bags on a moment's notice. I'm going to be shipped out of here 
uh, you're going to somewhere, you'll find out later. Uh, again, mentioned in my diaries. Finally, around the